I'd like to thank uh, Archery for the kind information, uh, the kind invitation to speak today uh, at this year's meeting and indeed for last year's uh, and uh, to give the opportunity to uh, talk about the future trends in BPH treatment, a quick run through really and the current options and those in the future. Uh, my name is Neil Barber, I'm a urologist in the UK and I've been lucky enough to be involved uh, in pretty much most of the new technologies as they've evolved over, evolved over the last 20 years. So where are we in 2022? Well, essentially, I think we can group those options in, into two sections, uh, those which are so-called cavitating or receptive treatments and the so-called minimally invasive surgical treatments. In that cavitating arm, we see some familiar options, including the TURP and its bipolar or plasma uh, newer version, the enucleation techniques using the holmium laser or thulium laser or even green light laser, as well as the green light laser vaporization technique. We know that these are good operations, that they achieve significant improvement in IPS and flow rate and have low intervention rates, uh, re-intervention rates over a, a long period of time. But we also know their downsides, including the requirement often for inpatient stay, for a post-operative urinary catheter requiring, in many cases, irrigation. And we also understand the perioptive uh, complications and that they inevitably carry some delay in symptom resolution and therefore return to normal activities. And we're particularly aware of their potential negative impact upon sexual function as regards both development of dry ejaculation and some negative impact upon erectile function. Into this group, I think we're now seeing the arrival of aquablation of the prostate using the aquabeam system. Indeed, one could argue now that 2022 is the year in which aquablation really comes of age uh, in terms of its place within this group as a viable alternative to those standard approaches, which uh, the newest of which is nearly 20 years old now. So what is aquablation? Aquablation is the only image-guided, heat-free, automated robotic therapy for BPH, employing real-time image guidance, that is through a transrectal ultrasound probe, uh, personalized planning, uh, an automated robotic execution. Uh, and of course, uniquely, it uses a heat-free water jet to remove an ablate tissue to create a wide cavity through the prostate and uh, disobstruct the outlet. There is both endoscopic and ultrasound view of the prostate. The software then allows you to plan uh, the uh, treatment based upon that person's particular shape of prostate, including middle lobes. And indeed, there are five zones within the algorithm, which really give the surgeon quite a lot of control in terms of deciding how to treat that individual's prostate. Why do I say it's come of age? Well, this year saw the publication of the five-year outcome data from the water study. That was a global prospective double-blind randomized trial versus TURP. And we've seen a, a sustained uh, improvement in symptoms in terms of improvement in IPSS, as well as the other uh, variables. Uh, and this is as good as the TURP in the arm. And indeed, in the 50 to 80 mil uh, group of, of size prostates within that trial, an ever so slight uh, advantage to the aquablation over the TURP. We overlay it here with the outcome from the other trials that have been done, that is WALTER2, which was a prospective multi-center trial in the US looking at prostate volumes to 80 to 150 mils. The Open Water Study, which is a multi-center trial in Europe, uh, which was uh, uh, off-label uh, and real world in the sense that there was very minimal exclusion criteria. And I haven't laid on here the French study as well, but we see the same kind and same level of improvement in symptoms across all those trials. As I say, we now know that will last out to five years and therefore can say that uh, aquablation does have long-term benefit. And we see how that benefit is different from both that we would look to see with drug therapy and with the so-called non-receptive or invasive surgical treatments. The outcomes are definitely in the same range as an ablative or receptive, sorry, as a receptive or cavitating procedure. The retreatment rate in that uh, water trial over the five years is 1% per year, aquablation, which in fact was ever so slightly better than the TURP arm. If you put all that data together and do a meta-analysis, uh, then of the, those studies plus the French study, we have over 400 men with prostate volumes ranging from 20 to 150 mils. And we see these big improvements in IPSS, flow rate and quality of life score. But these are all achieved uh, with a 10.8% a chance of developing dry ejaculation and apparently no impact upon erectile function. So this is the unique selling point really of aquablation and that it can treat all sizes of prostates with a significantly lower risk of negative impact on sexual function compared to the standard uh, operations. What about the minimally invasive surgical treatment group then? Well, we know about Urinift, Resume and ITIND, 
uh, that I discussed last year, and I won't touch on PAE uh, because of time. Um, but we know that the attraction of the Eurolyf Resume and ITIN group is that they can be performed as day case or in the office under local anaesthetic or some sedation. A number of them don't need a catheter or have a low risk of requiring one. And they are said to allow a more rapid return to normal activities with little or, or no impact on sexual function, be it in terms of ejaculation or erectile function. But there is a cost to that. We know that their improvement in symptom and flow is not that of a cavitated procedure, but still twice as good as one would expect with medication. And of course, there are questions regarding the durability of these procedures uh, compared to the standard approaches. Eurolift now uh, is well established with data range, uh, with good data demonstrating efficacy with prostates up to 80 mils. And in a number of countries, there's authorization to treat prostates up to 100 mils. We've seen publications confirming the technique can be applied to those with middle lobes using advanced approaches. And indeed, there is some uh, new, there was a new handpiece which is coming out, or is out in the States, I should say, which makes that somewhat easier. And I also tend to use a slightly modified approach in those men with very small prostates, but high type planar necks. We also have data for multi-center trial in the UK confirming efficacy in men in urinary retention, with about 80% or so being catheter-free at the end of the year. Uh, this is the five-year data from the original trial against sham for the FDA, with retreatment rates of 2 to 3% per year, but we uh, probably accept that it's slightly higher than that in the real world. This year has seen multiple presentations comparing outcome data uh, from those uh, tightly controlled trials against uh, retrospective data co collected from around the world of over two and a half thousand men. And we can see that that retrospective real world data reflects the data we've seen in the, in the uh, more tightly controlled trials, uh, both in men with obstructive lateral lobes, men with obstructive middle lobes, and indeed those of men in retention. Uh, and this is all achieved with zero negative impact on sexual function, be it ejaculation or erectile. And this high quality data, and particularly a prospective randomized trial against the standard of care in the form of TURP in the BPH6 trial, has meant that uh, Eurolyf finds itself in the standard algorithm for the, for the management of uh, the surgical management of uh, symptomatic BPH in the 2022 EAU guidelines, both as an option for men with 30 to 80 mil prostates, and also for men who are not fit enough to undergo uh, general anesthesia and are looking for a local anaesthetic option. So 2022 sees Eurolift become essentially, in the EAU eyes, part of the options of stand, part of the standard of care options uh, for men with symptomatic BPH. What about Resume? Well, Resume, as we know, uses steam to uh, ablate uh, the tissue within the prostate. And we uh, know that it has data relating to prostate volumes of 30 to 80 mils that you can treat a middle lobe. Uh, there is no, uh, good quality data, that is multi-centered data looking at men in urinary retention, although it's clearly it has been used to treat patients in such a situation, indeed with larger prostate volumes. However, in the latest EAU guidelines, uh, they quote a Cochrane review which suggests the level of data we have uh, it has a certainty ranging from moderate to very low and reiterate that they really do need to see a uh, prospective randomized trial against the standard of care for it to gain any more uh, secure place within that uh, standard of care algorithm that I outlined in the last slide. What data do we have then? Well, it's really just one data, that original pivotal study against sham for the FDA, and that did demonstrate good improvements in IPSS and uh, uh, maximum flow rate in line with that from the Eurolift. And we've seen with four and then five year data that these outcomes are maintained. And we know that this is a relatively low retreatment rate, certainly compared to Eurolift, and maybe it's advantage over that alternative. CLEAR is a uh, randomized, multi-centered global study of Eurolift versus Resume sponsored by Teleflex. And that's just in the recruitment phase now, particularly looking at the early recovery uh, following the procedure in terms of speed of getting back to normal activity and impact upon uh, quality of life, including sexual function. This may help to give us uh, some uh, high quality data versus what is now considered a standard of care in the form of Eurolift. ITIN, uh, the temporary implantable nitinol device, uh, a, procedure, uh, a device which sits uh, through the prostate and across the bladder neck, which is left in place for five to seven days. And during that time, uh, the uh, device expands, uh, making three longitudinal incisions through the prostate through pressure necrosis, essentially remodeling the bladder neck and the prostate to relieve obstruction. 
the device is moved under, removed under local anesthetic. And we know that from the data so far, that it doesn't have any impact upon sexual function, be it erectile or ejaculatory. There are a number of studies which have shown pretty much the same outcomes, particularly in terms of improvement in IPSS, and two of those studies now have three-year data. Uh, and uh, at the early part of last year, following a prospective randomized trial against SHAM, uh, ITIN was given uh, the go-ahead by the FDA, uh, and we're soon to see the publication of a prospective non-randomized multi-centered European trial MTO2 uh, with six-year uh, follow-up data, excluding those who have middle lobes, uh, who are not suitable for this procedure. Again, the EO guidelines suggest that a randomized trial against the reference uh, standard is required to gain any further recognition in terms of guidelines. And MTO8, is, uh, which is exactly that, a randomized multicenter trial versus Eurolift. Again, we see Eurolift seen as a standard of care, uh, is uh, looking to get going. Uh, and this is sponsored by Olympus, who now have the rights to the ITIN device. So what's coming down the line? Well, there are also four other pivotal trials against uh, sham coming along for the FDA. Uh, the first is Optilume, uh, and we're just coming towards the first end of that trial, uh, which is called Pinnacle, and that's on the background of a first-in-man trial in Latin America, which demonstrated really quite uh, impressive improvements in IPS and flow rate, somewhat better than the other mists, and approaching the, the outcome from the, the standard receptive or cavitating procedures uh, uh, which is really quite remarkable. That trial was called the Everest trial. Remember, Optilume has been developed uh, to treat urethral strictures. It's a balloon with paclitaxel coating. Um, and we're very interested to see what that one-year data from the Pinnacle trial is when it's released, I think, later in this year. We're also seeing the rebirth of the prostatic stent. So the three other studies all relate to that. Firstly, Zenflow, uh, which is the Zenflow spring, which is a not quite complete stent, if you like, that sits uh, in the mid prostate to relieve obstruction. Uh, the butterfly uh, looks to sort of reenact the effect of the urinif, holding the anterior urethra open, that's delivered through a rigid sheath. Uh, and Proverum or the Pro-V stent, which is an Irish stent, which is a more 360 stent in terms of holding the whole prost mid prostate uh, open. As regards Zenflow, then we have the Zest, the Zest EU studies, which were presented. And this is um, first in man trials if you like, in Australia and New Zealand, with some familiar big names there in terms of Peter Gilling and Peter Chin being involved, high levels of successful deployment, pretty good improvements in IPSS and flow rate in line with those minimum invasive surgical treatments. The Bree study then, the, the, the randomized trial against SHAM is now recruiting, uh, and it will be a year or so before we see the first results of that. Similarly, the butterfly stent, which I mentioned earlier on, um, this, is a, this is a stent that has different sizes, um, and so the prost uh, prostate length measurement is required to decide which size you want. It's deployed through a rigid cystoscope, and they presented uh, at the AUA and indeed the EAU first year, the uh, outcome of the first in man trials in uh, Egypt, with similar kind of improvements uh, that we're seeing uh, with the minimally invasive surgical treatments. Proverium or the Pro-V stent has done again first in man studies in Australia and now the PRUVE study is looking to recruit that randomized trial against sham for the FDA, 30 to 80 mil prostate, no middle lobes, so no middle lobes are not part of uh, what can be treated by this new family of prostatic stents. This one's made a nitinol, and as I say, expands in 360s to hold the whole, 360 degrees to hold the whole prostate open. And again, much like um, Zenflow, they have their own bespoke uh, flexible system delivery system to place the stent accurately. What other gizmos are there? Well, there's been a little chatter about um, the rebirth of other ways to ablate the, the prostate following the success of uh, Resume. So this is a transperineal um, uh, ultrasound guided laser abl interstitial laser ablation uh, piece of kit using a 300 micron diode laser. Uh, with one to two treatments per lateral lobe under la local anesthetic in the office with a bespoke transrectal ultrasound uh, guidance that's probe and guidance system as well as planning software and they're claiming some 40 percent reduction in prostate volume we saw uh, the presentation the first in man uh, trial in italy at the eau last year with 43 mil prostate on average in nine days with the catheter with reasonable improvements in both flow rate and ipss i think in line with the other uh, missed procedures and no impact upon sexual function. At the AUA, uh, just a week ago, uh, we saw a um, presentation of uh, some outcome data using this device from Miami of 20 men with prostate volumes ranging from 30 to 120 mils. And again, as you can see from this uh, photograph of the slide, 
uh, reasonable improvements in both IPSS and flow rate, but clearly much higher quality multi-centered and, and preferably randomized trials are required to really understand the role of this. Although, as we can see, uh, Resume is now leading to uh, interest again in, in many approaches in terms of ablating the prostate. Not least the MRI guided transurethral laser ultrasound ablation. Uh, this uses a bespoke device uh, which is placed in the urethra and there are 10 sections to it. So in the MRI scanner, when you can identify the transition zone, you can then sculpt, if you like, the delivery of the ultrasound energy to ablate the prostate tissue to the shape of that um, transition zone. And it does, of course, require a rectal probe as well in terms of um, keeping an eye on temperature and potential damage towards the rectum. It's really quite slow uh, and procedure times are well over an hour or even two, but we do see in this very small trial from Scandinavia, a reasonable improvement in both um, IPSS flow rate and a reduction in prostate volume. And again, they describe little no impact upon sexual function. So where are we then for 2023 uh, in terms of the surgical options available? Beyond the ones that we saw last year in the minimally invasive surgical tre uh, treatment group, we're seeing trials for Optilume, the Zemphilo Spring, the Pro-V Stent, and the Butterfly. And in the cavitating surgery or reception uh, treatment group, we see the arrival of aquablation with high quality and now long-term data in terms of uh, efficacy. If we move forward, what do I think is gonna be uh, like to be big players in this field? Well, I think aquablation is now here to stay with this such good and high quality data. And there are many attractive features to it, which I think are no doubt leading to increased interest and increased delivery in terms of numbers of patients around the world. As regards to new arrivals in the minimally invasive surgical treatment group, uh, the, the early data related to Optidum really does make that very exciting. And this could be a real game changer in terms of uh, what options we have in this group going forward. Clearly we await the data from that uh, pinnacle trial uh, later in the year and longer term data as well. Uh, but I think that's the one to keep an eye on going forward. Again, many thanks for asking me to talk at this meeting. Uh, and um, it's been a pleasure to talk about these options and I hope uh, everybody's learned something new.